Hello and welcome to Bite Size Med. This video is on renal circulation. The kidney's excretory function results in the formation of urine, and they do that from blood. The kidneys have a high blood flow. They get around 25% of the cardiac output. Now the standard layout of a circulatory pathway involves arteries, branching into arterioles, and then capillaries, followed by venules and veins. The kidney is the same, but different. So there's a renal artery and a renal vein, yes. The renal arteries, both right and left, they come off the aorta. And the renal veins drain into the inferior vena cava. Now first we're going to look at what happens in between. The renal artery enters at the hilum of the kidney. The first set of branches, these are the segmental arteries. They then pass between the pyramids, and these branches are the interlobar arteries. They then sort of arch over the tops and form the arcuate arteries. Before the arcuate arteries are the interlobar arteries, and after that are the smaller interlobular arteries. The kidneys have an outer cortex and an inner medulla. The cortex is better perfused than the medulla. The glomeruli of the nephrons, they are in the cortex. So here are the interlobular arteries, they form the afferent arterioles. The afferent arterial enters the glomerulus, and what leaves the glomerulus is the efferent arterial. So in between, we have the glomerular capillaries. These are a bunch of fenestrated capillaries that do the function of filtering blood that's coming in. The efferent arterioles, they then form peritubular capillaries around the rest of the nephron. The peritubular capillaries then drain into the venous system. So now the pathway is going to go in reverse. We start with the interlobular veins, followed by the arcuate veins, then the interlobar veins, and the segmental veins. Now the segmental veins are going to drain into the renal vein, which exits at the hilum of the kidney and drains into the inferior vena cava. Peritubular capillaries, they are in the cortical nephrons. Another type of nephron is the juxtamedullary nephron. Now, these nephrons have long loops that extend down into the deeper medulla. They have specialized capillaries that go along with them in the same U shape. These are the vasa recta, and they are important for the countercurrent exchange in the countercurrent mechanism. So you can see that the efferent from the glomerular capillary network, instead of entering veins, what did it do? It formed another capillary network around the tubules. So this is a portal system, and that's one of the special features of renal circulation. The flow through circulation is the pressure difference over the resistance. So here the flow would be the renal blood flow. Uh, the pressure difference would be the difference between renal arterial and renal venous pressure. And the resistance would be renal vascular resistance. Of all the vessels, the small vessels, like the interlobular arteries, the afferent and the efferent arterioles, they offer the highest resistance. So that's how you can regulate flow. By increasing the resistance in these vessels, the renal blood flow would reduce. The renal plasma is filtered by the glomerulus, but only 20% normally gets filtered. That's called the filtration fraction, the fraction of the renal plasma that got filtered by the glomerulus. The glomerulus is a set of capillaries, and like other capillaries, what controls filtration, that will be starling forces. There are two hydrostatic and oncotic pressures on either side. But the most important one here is the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries. Here that would be the glomerulus, so it's the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus. This is the pressure from fluid or blood itself. So it can be changed depending upon the flow through the arterioles, the afferent and the efferent arterioles. By changing the pressure and resistance of either of these, the amount of plasma that gets filtered, that changes as well. Like if the afferent arteriole is dilated, like say under the effect of some prostaglandins, that means there's more renal plasma flow. That increases the capillary hydrostatic pressure, so there's a higher filtration, and that's our GFR, so there's a higher GFR. The opposite would happen if it gets constricted. There will be a lower renal plasma flow, lower hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus, and so lower filtration. 
Now, if the efferent arterial gets constricted, like under the influence of something like angiotensin 2, that would increase the back pressure in the capillaries. So there's a high capillary hydrostatic pressure. So the GFR actually increases. This would be if there is a moderate constriction of the afferent arterial. But what if it's severe? The renal blood flow reduces by a lot, and plasma proteins, they get stuck accumulating in the glomerulus. The thing about the glomerular filtration barrier is plasma proteins can't get through. And plasma proteins are responsible for oncotic pressure. Now this becomes more than the effect of the hydrostatic pressure. What does oncotic pressure do? It pulls fluid in the opposite direction towards the capillary. So the GFR reduces when the constriction is severe. Versus when the constriction was moderate, the GFR increases. By the time the plasma reaches the peritubular capillaries, now the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries is lower than the interstitium. What would that mean? The direction of flow is opposite from the interstitium towards the capillaries. That's reabsorption. So this arrangement helps filtration happen at the glomerulus where the pressure is higher and reabsorption happen at the tubules where there's lower pressure. Now this circulation is autoregulated, which means it's regulated by itself, over a wide range of pressure changes. Otherwise, if the renal pressure changes just by a little, then the GFR would also change, renal excretion would change every time that happened. So GFR and renal plasma flow, they go together. By regulating the renal plasma flow, we can regulate the GFR. So how would we regulate the flow? By changing the resistance in the afferent and the efferent arterioles. There are two mechanisms by which the kidneys autoregulate their flow. One of them is the myogenic mechanism. Myo means muscle, so this is in reference to the smooth muscle that's in the wall of the vessels. When the pressure in the vessels increases and the vessel stretches, calcium ions enter into the smooth muscle cells. What does calcium influx do? It causes smooth muscle to contract. And if the smooth muscle contracts, the vessel is going to constrict. So the vessel is resisting being stretched. And that's how it keeps the flow constant. The second mechanism is feedback from the renal tubule to the glomerulus. So it's called tubuloglomerular feedback. This is by a group of structures right here, which is called the juxta glomerular apparatus. Now that has three parts, the macula densa, which is modified cells of the distal convoluted tubule, there are extra glomerular mesangial cells, which are outside the glomerulus, and the modified cells of the afferent arterial. These are called the juxta glomerular cells, or the JG cells. So together, this entire thing, it forms the juxta glomerular apparatus. The JG cells are the ones that produce renin. The macula densa is a sensor. It detects flow rate through the tubular lumen and the sodium chloride levels. When there's a low arterial pressure, or if the renal blood flow is low, that'll reduce the capillary hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus. If that's low, that means there's going to be less filtration. So there's less sodium chloride reaching the distal convoluted tubule. And the macula densa, it senses this. And then it tells the juxtaglomerular cells that there's low sodium chloride. So the JG cells, they then produce renin. What does renin do? It converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, and then by the angiotensin-converting enzyme, angiotensin 2 gets formed. This then acts on the efferent arterial and constricts it. Angiotensin 2 preferentially acts on the efferent arterial. And remember what we went over earlier, what would happen if the efferent arterial constricts? The capillary pressure in the glomerulus, that hydrostatic pressure, it increases. So that means there's more filtration now. So the GFR increases and the sodium chloride levels get fixed. The macula densa also acts on the afferent arterial and dilates it. So again, that would contribute to increasing the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus and increasing the GFR. So despite a change in the renal arterial pressure or in the renal blood flow, the GFR got maintained. If the sodium chloride levels are high, then again, the macula densa would detect this. It releases adenosine, which acts on the afferent arterial and constricts it. 
Now what would happen? There's reduced renal plasma flow. There's low capillary pressure in the glomerulus, so the filtration, and that's the GFR, is reduced. Lastly, how is renal blood flow measured? Well, renal plasma flow is measured using para-aminohypuric acid. By measuring its clearance, we can get the renal plasma flow. But PAH is only like 90% cleared, so it's just the effective renal plasma flow that you can get with this. The renal blood flow is the renal plasma flow over 1 minus the hematocrit. And that is renal circulation. If this video helped you, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.